government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on thesseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So today I have Graham Smith coming in from Nigita, Japan. He is the founder of the Voluntary Japan YouTube channel and Facebook page by the same name. And on Twitter, you can find him at Voluntary Japan. On Steam It, he threw you a curveball. He's at Kafkanarchy. <laughs> K A F K A N A R C H Y. Kafka Energy. So, uh, yeah, don't look for Voluntary Japan on Steam. Uh, <laughs> so, we're going to talk about his um, his path to voluntarism, uh, why he loves peaceful parenting, because that's why uh, he initially we got in touch. He sent me a video of him talking about peaceful parenting. He has a child, I think, of three years old, right? You said? That's right. Right. Yep. And uh, he's been on Steam It quite a bit. So, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And, um, Anything else you might want to talk about? So, uh, so Graham, thanks a lot for coming on the show. And thanks for having me on, Danilo. I've uh, been watching you for a little while now, and super excited to be here. So, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that you <clears throat> that you posted your video on my uh, my channel because I I had no idea about your work, and you just I think you recently started your channel, and um, and you know I love to support anybody. Uh, around the world who is um, promoting these ideas because he, he, you know what I absolutely love is when I see Facebook pages like Voluntarists in Bangladesh, Voluntarists in Pakistan and it's just a beautiful thing. You know, people from all over the world making these kind of uh, or spreading these ideas of liberty regardless of where they were born, you know, or, or they grew up or their culture and uh, and it's a beautiful thing. So I love, I think it brings people together just like the internet, you know, brings people together. So, um, so yeah, I'm delighted to, uh, to have you on the show. Uh, so before we get into uh, your channel, what you talk about, just uh, if you can go into your history of how you got into volunteerism and anarchy. Yeah, sure. So um, I've always been an anti-authoritarian since I think like third grade probably. I just remember uh, hating school and um, I actually thought of this before the interview, but I remember writing a poem in third grade uh, – what was it? I remember it exactly. The last verse was like, I'm so happy I could cry. We finally get to get out of this pigsty. <laughs> I remember my teacher my teacher told me to change it. And so I, I took the paper back and didn't change it and just returned it in. And that, that ended up being in the school's uh, final like anthology or whatever. But <laughs> as far as I can remember, it probably has a lot to do with my dad. Um, I've always questioned authority and I want to say false authority or illegitimate authority. Um, but I was a statist. Until just maybe three years ago, um, outwardly. But what led me to anarchism was logic, ultimately. Um, I've always been uh, interested in thinking about things logically. Um, I campaigned for Ron Paul back in 2008, pretty hardcore. Got That's when I first got interested in politics. Before that, I just ignored politics. I just cared about music and whatever. But that's when I actually got excited, like, oh, maybe the world can actually change. And fast forward to Japan, came to Japan and started watching some Larkin Rose videos. And at first I thought it was really weird. Like, who is this guy talking about, I can steal from you? This is really weird. Like, uh, but what finally clicked was I was watching a Stefan Molyneux video. And I don't agree with everything about Stefan, but when he argues points, sometimes he's extremely lucid and, and, and just really dead on. But he, he made the point about taxation, like if you advocate taxation, you're advocating violence against me. And that that just like something snapped inside of me then. And I was like, OK, I'm going to join these weird people that are calling themselves voluntarists, <laughs> anarchists, because this makes total sense to me. This is how I've always felt. So I actually became an anarchist here in Japan. Um, it kind of took that separation from home to bring it out. But that's the long and short of it. Yeah, 
I think I've always been an anarchist. It just, I think we all have. It just takes us a while to realize it, and we realize it at different times. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, Molyneux and Larkin Rose, yeah, really big figures in the in the volunteers community. And um, yeah, for me, I think I, I found Molyneux first with the peaceful parenting. My wife sent me a um, a video on. Um, uh, you know, I think it's like 17 reasons not to spank, something like that. And uh, that was when my son was just born in 2010. And that was my first exposure to Stefan Molyneux. And then, I, you know, I, you know, checking out his other videos, it's like the whole world opened up. And uh, it's fascinating. Like you said, it's like, um, you know, when you see some people say what you've been thinking about for so long, it's uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a relief, right? <laughs> yeah, and what what you've almost been afraid to say. And and that just legitimizes it for you. Oh, it's not that weird after all. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you hear somebody say this, it's like it, sometimes I heard some people say like when they uh, when they watch people when they watch Larkin Rose with his videos, they're like, "You can say that." <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, uh, well, that's like when, when should you shoot a cop? Like right. when that came out. Like, you know, I'm. I'm like out of all my friends, the most open-minded about that stuff. But like, I read that title and my programming from the past is just like, what? What did you title that? Like, you know, watch the video. And it's like, yeah, I agree 100 percent with all of this. But, uh, yeah, yeah, and I think I think a lot of people misconstrue that video to like oh, that you should shoot cops. You know, exactly. Like, and that, that's the whole point. Like, people are scandalized by it, but they don't take the time to actually, you know, hear the message. So. Yeah, yeah. So um, awesome, awesome. And uh, and uh, any books uh, that you read uh, that influenced your journey? Um, I really like classic novels, and I think those kind of influenced me indirectly. Um, but like Crime and Punishment uh, by Dostoevsky, that stuff kind of gives you a history lesson and gets you thinking along the lines of the human condition and philosophy. Um, probably the most influential book would be the essay self-reliance by emerson um i don't know if you've if you've read that but um when i was in high school i read self-reliance and that just totally flipped me out um trust yourself you know imitation is suicide that kind of stuff i i was totally in tune with that so i think that's when it really started to resonate with me the whole anarchist thing too so oh. ralph Waldo emerson yeah i haven't i've yet to read like all the like rothbard and I've read quotes and stuff, but um, for me, it was more along the, the classical line. I like classic novels and stuff. Uh, Grapes of Wrath is a big one. Um, talks a lot about the government during the Depression and the Dust Bowl. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's historical. You know, it's fiction, but it's actual stuff that happens. So, so yeah, that. And uh, as far as unschooling, there's a book called Summer Hill. Um, there's a school called Summer Hill in England, which is a free school, democratic school. I read that in college when I was actually studying to be an elementary school teacher. And that book made me not want to be an elementary school teacher. Um, it was one of the most beautiful books I'd ever read. It, it made me question my religious upbringing. It just basically broke open everything for me. So, yeah, I would credit that book a lot, too, with my transition to anarchism. It's called Summer Hill by A.S. Neal. Yeah, I did hear about those um, books, uh, or not the books, but uh, the idea of free schooling and unschooling. And this, I don't know if you heard of the Sudbury Valley School. And, yeah, and I think yeah. S- Summerhill is is along those lines, right? Like, is it like a democratic school where the, there's no, um, you know, the kids and and teachers vote, and there's no, you know, no test homeworks or grades or anything like that. Um, and that's an awesome. It's really an awesome thing. Um, and uh, I mean, I mean, we don't do it. Um, I guess partly because of the cost. <laughs> it's quite expensive those places. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I basically support that, and um, you know, we 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 do homeschooling. You know, tending more towards unschooling. Um, and uh, yeah, I remember doing my research about that when my when my son was young. Um, and uh, yeah, I found some documentaries on unschooling and. I thought they were really awesome. Just made sense, you know. And and to me, you know, peaceful parenting and unschooling go together. Um, I don't think uh, in in some people may, maybe not, but you know, to me, it's just a natural, um, you know, uh, mel- melding of the two. Uh, and and so yeah. So so there was. Um, let me think. Is there any um, any book that I read? I know my wife sent me this book. Uh, can um, I think it's called Unconditional Parenting by Alfie Cohn, right? You've read uh, Alfie Cohn. Yeah, I'm yeah. familiar with Cohn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so some books like that. Um, 
but yeah, yeah, I really, I really love the idea of homeschooling, and uh, it, to me, it just, it just makes sense, you know, to uh, have the ability to, you know, guide your child, you know, and and be be the person to help expose them to the world rather than, uh, you know, um, have some, you know, pre predetermined uh, bureaucratic formula of useless information, <laughs> you know, uh, being that's stu- designed to make kids fail in the first place. Yeah. 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 I think yeah, that reminds me of a Ted talk I saw where this kid was talking about homeschooling and, and he was saying the reason it, that he loves homeschooling is, and he, and he, and he said like, um, public school makes you less intelligent, which is a um, pretty, uh, shocking statement. <laughs> it is. It is. Are you familiar with John Holt? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That guy was a huge influence on me. Like when I was in college studying elementary ed, like all these guys just, I was just reading their books voraciously mm. and like John Taylor Ghetto as yeah, well. Right, right. Like the thing that flipped me out about Summerhill was being raised in a religious household. Uh, the guy that founded Summerhill back in the 1940s said, you know, people are not bad. People are not bad. Like when people, when their needs are met, they're not bad. Mm. So like instead of moralizing punishment, why don't we just show these kids that there's consequence for their actions and not tell them, hey, you're a bad person. It, hey, you broke Bobby's bicycle, now you've got to pay for the parts, and that's just how it is. Like, it's not that you're a bad person. So um, the stories they tell in that book are just about kids, like, coming out of, like, Catholic schools and just being so traumatized and then shedding that pain and then becoming really well-balanced, like, well-adjusted human beings. So for me, I thought that was so, just so cool. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point because, um, you know, the, you know we, we talk about like uh, people say that there's a problem with bullies in, uh, in public schools and, you know, where else do you see a problem with bullies and gangs is in prison, <laughs> you know, and, and it's basically the, uh, I think, a natural result of uh, forced association between people who don't want to be together, <laughs> you know, and of course you're going to get, you know, that kind of rebellion you know, and, uh, and internal strife, you know, I think it's, it's only natural with people that, you know, they're, they're like, well, how are they going to socialize? I'm like, well, actually, if you want them to be bullied, you know, send them to public school. <laughs> That's the worst yeah. place, worst place to be socialized. Yeah. It, it turns kids into something else. I mean, you can tell the difference here. I don't know about the States, but little kids I teach, you can tell the difference between them and the kids that are in the public schooling system. Mm. Like, I don't want to say they become dumber, but they become Summer. like they they, <laughs> they stop thinking so creatively and openly like a little kid and start to be really competitive and really kind of nasty to each other it's like the prison atmosphere like like what you're saying right yeah that right. becomes everything that kind of ego egoic survival becomes everything as compared to experiencing life and and loving it Oh yeah! So. Oh yeah! Definitely. Uh, so, please tell me about your um, your YouTube channel um, and why you started it, and um, and what do you uh, you know what's your goal with it? Sure, I started my YouTube channel maybe six or seven months ago, nine months ago. I can't remember. Um, I was living in a different town at that time, out in the mountains, middle of nowhere, uh, working in a public school here in Japan, and feeling more and more and more strong, strongly about anarchism and voluntarism, and I wanted to tell somebody about it. So um, the best avenue I found was I just thought one night, well, I'm going to make uh, a video, an introduction to anarchism. And my original idea was to also do stuff in Japanese um, because what I really want to do is spread the ideas to people here and also use this kind of different cultural background to spread the ideas to people back in the States but from a different cultural perspective. So the first video I made, like I, I wasn't even really serious. I just thought I'm just going to talk into the camera and see what happens. And <laughs> so I called it introduction to anarchism. Mm-hmm. And, um, I just talked about the very basics of voluntarism and uh, non-aggression principle. Um, but for me more than anything, it's just been an outlet and something to help me stay excited about life. <laughs> When a lot of the stuff, especially at that time, a lot of what I had to do, I wasn't into at all. Like going to work at the public school every day, I hated. And um, I like the kids, I like the people, but the whole system. So doing the videos made me kind of feel alive mm-hmm. at that time when it was a little bit difficult. So 
and it's slowly growing. I mean, I have, I think, 164 subscribers now, so it's not Adam Kokesh huge, but it's <laughs> my, it's, it's my little thing and I'm really <laughs> proud of it. So, uh, yeah, I'm having fun with it. I started to do a few more videos in Japanese, um, because volunteerism and things like that, like people are actually really open to it here, but there's nobody talking about it. So, so I kind of want to be, one of the first i know uh over here though there's already some uh, of course roger ver is here mm -hmm. uh james corbett from corbett report oh, right amazing like right. that guy just like a workaholic like yeah his stuff's amazing so those guys are already here so they kind of inspired me and i've reached out to them a little bit online and said hey what's up i'm here too and mm. i love what you're doing so it's kind of that's that's basically it i want to use my channel uh i like to do animation I like to play music, so anarchism is kind of giving me a way to just combine all that stuff to one purpose. So, yeah, that's about it. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and, and so would you say that your focus is more like you do the peaceful parenting and, uh, and volunteerism, uh, right? Is, is that your main focus? And also, I guess, recently, the uh, Steam It, you talk a lot about. Steam It, yeah. I mean, peaceful parenting through, the, through studying in college, Summerhill and stuff, that all the child psych stuff kind of brought me to anarchism and working in schools. But I think my main thing is I just, just the very basic logic of it all. Like that's why I like, like your new, your latest video you posted talking about like, <laughs> why does morality apply to us and not to this people in this abstract thing that's not even real called government. That's always been the thing that's gotten me the most passionate. So I just want to lay that out as, as simply as possible with logic. So however I can do that. Um, with kids and peaceful parenting, it really gets me fired up because I hate to see, especially kids subjected to that kind of garbage, you know, that kind of programming. So um, I guess all in all, just very simple, basic, logical stuff from a sort of creative angle maybe, like stop motion animation, simple talks. Um, I ramble a lot, so just wherever I am <coughs> just making videos, stuff like that. But awesome. Yeah. 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 My, uh, my focus, I think with my channel, I mean, I talk about a lot of stuff, um, you know, volunteerism, agorism, anarchy, uh, free markets, mm -hmm. Austrian economics, um, precious metals, monetary system, <laughs> central banking, federal reserve. But I think I focus, um, a lot on peaceful parenting and unschooling and homeschooling. Um, you know, primarily cause I'm a, I'm a father, uh, but right. also because I really think that that's um, that's one of the best ways that we can improve the world, you know, is being a model for our kids and uh, raising um, compassionate, kind, gentle, loving people, <laughs> you know, making the next generation um, more sensitive to, um, you know, aggression <laughs> and, and not supporting an institution of violence, you know, very simple. <laughs> yeah, I was just telling my one of my good friends here at the barbecue tonight. Um, He's like, you know, I think I'm coming to anarchism through parenting. He was never an anarchist. One of my best friends was telling me tonight he's not an anarchist at all. Well, he is, I think, but not yet. But he's like, you know, I think I'm coming to believe in anarchism through parenting. Because um, he's been reading some of the stuff I wrote on Steemit, and I introduced him to other peaceful parenting stuff. And he's like, you know, violence is wrong. I've always thought that, but I've never expanded it outward. And... um. I think what you're saying is so important because I think that might be the single most effective way to end the state is just raising children in a loving home that's mm -hmm. nonviolent and non -exclusive. Because no matter how much you harp at people about logic and stuff, it takes kind of an internal understanding or feeling. If you have a whole generation raised with, hey, I just know it's wrong to coerce other people it's just going to naturally there's going to be no way for a state to exist so yeah i would agree i would agree there definitely yeah yeah and um i mean i i think that people come to all these different concepts at different times you know if you, you develop you know you, you you learn about anarchy then you learn about volunteerism then you learn about you know uh, the federal reserve agorism and the peaceful parenting and unschooling and to me i mean it all comes together to you know it all it all is related. Yeah, so I, I really feel that um, that peaceful parenting and unschooling, you know, and volunteerism and agorism and, and all that are, are all related. Um, 
now, you know, I see that now, but I think a lot of people don't necessarily see that. Uh, um, but, but I think, uh, I think it's definitely vital because, um, you know, we can talk to adults about, uh, about these ideas and, uh, and that's good, but but it's much more difficult to um, get them to see because you know they've already been years and years of thinking a certain way, right? But uh, you know if you if you raise children in a different way, um, you know to not accept coercion in any fashion, right? It doesn't matter, you know what they call it. Doesn't matter what kind of um, status they have, what kind of badge they have, right? Um, then uh, I think we'll we'll see a very different world. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think Larkin Rose said something along those lines. He's like, "What what will change the world is not necessarily convincing everyone through logic, because most people, uh, for better or for worse, are just gonna follow everyone else. Mm. So once you have the majority of people just thinking, "Hey, coercion is wrong," mm-hmm. the other ones are just gonna kind of go along, you know. So I thought that was an interesting point. Like it's not, it doesn't say a lot for humanity, but <laughs> I, I think it's kind of true. You know, if you get, if you get these people that are really thinking about this stuff, the majority of people saying, Hey, it's just, I don't even think about coercing people. I wasn't raised that way. It's yeah. going to be a lot harder for anything like the state to exist. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, most people I think are good intentioned. Um, you know, they don't use, yeah. like I said in my video, they don't use violence um, to solve their problems or they don't advocate other people use violence to solve their problems or um, that a large group of people uh, use violence to solve their problems. But for some reason, when you um, uh, vote for somebody to do the very same thing, it's it's all of a sudden acceptable uh, and moral. And uh, and how does that how does that disconnect you know happen you know how does that how do you cr- you know cross that bridge and connect those things um, and it doesn't make sense you know the idea that you can't delegate a right you don't have there's certain people that um, or I guess most people did not come to this idea through uh, reason and evidence and logic and so how can you use reason and evidence and logic to to you know, uh, change their mind or <laughs> show them a new way. It's absolutely maddening though once you do get it because it's like, come on, come on, like it's so, it's so obvious. Like, come on, stop banging your head against the wall. Just walk out the door with me, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah one of my uh, one of my friends uh, used the analogy of like in everyone's mind, there's like a man on top of an elephant, right? And the right. man is the um, is the logical, logical, rational side of the brain, and the elephant is the emotional, uh, you know. Rep, reptilian brain uh you know limbic system type thing and uh and sometimes if the man wants to go left but the elephant wants to go right <laughs> what can the man really do not much so please um yeah tell me a little bit more about steam it and <coughs> and uh, why you find it to be you know um you know one of the best things to happen to uh, to volunteerism sure yeah um i've actually gone back and forth with steam it from thinking like this is too good to be true to thinking, to believing it actually is really good. Um, right now, I, I love Steemit, um, and I think uh, it's good for volunteer of the content. Um, when the content is incentivized, like for those of you that don't know about Steemit, you get paid to post in a cryptocurrency called Steam. So like, whereas on Facebook, you might post something and you know have people just uh, trolling your post slinging cuss words around, calling you all sorts of names. Mm. Steam it, you don't find that very much because you're going to ruin your own reputation. Like, I think that's a beautiful thing. Like, even if you disagree, there's no need to just immediately dismiss someone as a person. And uh, people like Sterling Lujan, like, you're on there. <clears throat> I just find actual, it's the first time I've seen anarcho-capitalists and anarcho-communists talk to each other peacefully as well, which I, <laughs> to me, that's like a miracle. That's like hell freezing over. <laughs> I talked to an ANCOM on there and it was actually civil and that, that just amazed me. So, so yeah, the main thing for me about Steemit is the same as Bitcoin, which is if people start adopting cryptocurrencies, it's going to take away the state's power to wage war, which for me, that's the main thing that excites me about it. Um, the second main thing would be I've never been paid for writing, uh, but I've been writing all my life. So when I saw that I could actually make money writing, it was, it was almost too good to be true. So um, I actually recently left my main job. And on the same day I left my main job in August, 
uh, some anarchists brought, I was already on Steemit, but that was the day Jeff Berwick made like 15 G's on one post or something. Mm -hmm. so I started talking about it. So then I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to really do this. And uh, my first few posts didn't make anything, but um, I got some advice from Sterling Lujan. Started digging inside, tried to make a really honest post, and uh, started making a little money. So for me, it's just like I'm super excited about it. Uh, one, for the how it's subver subversive to the state, and two, just for the quality of the content. So, yeah. How about you? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on the whole steam it? Yeah, I was introduced to it by a Facebook friend, um, this uh, vegan anarchist, Tanisha, and she moved down to Chile a couple months ago. And um, and she told me about it. She's like, you know, you should get on this thing. It's uh, for content creators. It's really awesome. So I'm like, all right. I, I mean, I didn't, really, I didn't really think much of it. I'm like, all right, I'll post some stuff on there. I just post my videos and everything. And I saw, you know, people, um, I guess, uh, upvoting it and getting some money. And I'm like, eh, well, what is this? And, <laughs> and uh, I guess I didn't really take it seriously until um, Sterling posted his video. Um, yeah, I think it's called How Why Steam It Will Revolutionize the World, something like that. And then Jeff Berwick got on and he made his $15,000. And then I'm, I'm like, whoa, man, <laughs> now everybody's getting it. That's pretty cool. So that's it's it's more of a, an incentive for me to post now. So now I'm doing a little more regularly. Um, I'm not really, you know, hoping to make much money, um, but I'm just doing it just to spread content and spread ideas. And, uh, you know, if it does make something that's nice, um, my, my wife is a little bit disillusioned with a lot of things that I've done in the past, <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I'm like, this is going to make some money. So she's like, yeah. <laughs> so I, I stopped telling her that and I'm just, I'm like, I'm just doing it. Like I post my content on watch, you know, watch my bit dot com. No, no. It's, uh, <clears throat> it was made by Doug Scribner. Who's um he was interviewed by Jeff Borwick on Anarchast and um and it's basically the same thing as Netflix but with Bitcoin. So you okay. can you can purchase it's like pay per view, you know, these videos or, or movies or you know, whatever, and you pay with Bitcoin instead of Federal Reserve notes. And so um, you know, so I got on there and I'm actually gonna interview him too. Um and I uh yeah, so I've been posting my interviews on there for a while. I'm not expecting to make anything, um, but it's just fun. You know, I'm just supporting his platform and everything. Um, so I, I, I post my interviews on various places, you know, to support people. And so, yeah, the Steam It thing, I post my stuff there. And, uh, you know, I see yeah, big-time players like Roger Veer and uh, Adam Burr. Kokesh and Larkin Rose and Jeff Burrick. And, they you know, they're making a good amount of money, which is great. Um, <laughs> I guess I don't have the following they have. But, uh, but yeah, I'm posting my stuff there. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. As a, as a cryptocurrency, it's a, it's a very interesting learning opportunity for people to learn what is a cryptocurrency and why it's so important uh, to, you know, defang the state uh, monopoly on currency. Right. And right. Uh, and what what does that mean? Like, what does that mean? A monopoly on currency, you know, and, and how detrimental is that to the people? Right. And uh, and how, you know, money used to be, you know, you know, when you know, because everybody only knows when you say money, you know, you, people think they mean um, Federal Reserve notes or bank notes. Right. But but historically, money was not necessarily that. Right. And it doesn't have to be that. That's the perversion of money. Money is just a transaction, you know, a tool for transacting, you know, um, moving value from A to B. And, uh, you know, so it's just a tool. You know, I tell people it's just a tool like a like a computer, like a screwdriver, like a car uh, that uh, improves our lives. And so, you know, the tool can never be immoral. But, um, you know, what people use the tool for, of course, can be or the, the right. intent that the person has using the tool can be immoral. And, and I remember you did a video on Steam about Steam and like, like talking about the value, like how does all this value happen, you know, um, when people are just voting, upvoting, upvoting and you get money like like where's the money coming from? Who's funding this? Right. right. <laughs> right. And I think that's what that's what throws a lot of people off is you, you try to have that conversation. Well, where does your U.S. dollar get value from, right. you know? Well, it's paper now. There's nothing. There's no gold behind it. And if you want to argue that, even gold is a, is a subjectively valued, you know, precious metal. So it's like uh, that. That got me really excited about steam. It's like, oh, these people are just basically giving the middle finger to other currency and saying we're choosing to use this. And because we say have it, we say it has value, it does. And I just I love that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really it's really a fascinating thing. Yeah, talking about subjective value. Um, you're right. Nothing has inherent value. You're right. Value is given by the people who use it 
right? And the amount of people that use it. Larkin Rose did a great, I don't know if you follow his rants, that he does daily rants. Sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he, so he did one on, on, uh, on the value of money and where value comes from. And basically, the value of things is in how many people use it, right? So he was saying that before, like uh, when VHS came out, there was some other company that was competing with VHS. And the only reason that, you know, VHS got big was because I guess it was advertised, but maybe a better marketing scheme, you know, people loved it. And it's not necessarily that the thing is actually useful. It's that people believe that it will be useful because yeah. the reputation of something is so powerful. Like if somebody were to, you know, make a post or an article saying how horrible VHS is, don't, don't buy it, don't invest your money. And then millions of people believe them and then millions of people abandon VH. it's going to it's going to destroy the, the field so it's it's a really big confidence game just just the idea of value you know and people like to think gold and silver have value and no they don't have intrinsic value i mean you know they can be used for jewelry and different things like that you know the value is in people wanting to use it it's like people use it and then more people want it and then more people want it <laughs> this is kind of yeah, yeah, it's like it feeds off itself, right. like a cycle, right? It's like if you're building a house, you know, and you've, you've got a box full of nails, you've got plenty of nails, they have they have value to you. When you run out of nails, then wh any any nail you find is going to become extremely valuable. It's like, <laughs> you know, we experience that all our lives, like uh, little kids playing with rocks. Oh, look, I got this blue rock. You don't have any blue rocks. Oh, everyone wants a blue rock. It's like, it's exactly the same as, as money. Yeah, there's yeah. When I got into all this stuff, I I, um, I entered uh, in the beginning through the monetary system and learning about the Federal Reserve and precious metals and uh, what's the difference between money and currency. Uh, I read the book uh, Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin. Okay. Uh, have you? I don't know if you have you read that one. I'm familiar with it, but I have. That's not. an awesome one. You you definitely got to read that one. You would love it. Um, it goes into the whole history of uh, the Federal Reserve, money and banking, and central banking and all that, and precious metals, and uh, and then. And then I also read uh, Murray Rothbard, what, what Has Government Done to Our Money? Uh, and then The Case for the 100% Gold Dollar. And and then also Mike Maloney. Uh, are you familiar with Mike Maloney from goldsilver.com? No, I think through your through some of your interviews I've heard about. Him. Yeah, oh, I talk about him a lot. I know, I talk, <laughs> I talk about him a lot. Um, and he wrote a book called uh, Rich Dad's Guide to Investing in Gold and Silver. And so I read that, really awesome book. And... Um, and yeah, so he talks about different cycles in history and, and why in, during monetary crises, people have flocked to precious metals. And also another thing he says kind of interesting is that wealth is never destroyed. It is merely transferred, right? So so wealth is something that's built up, accumulated over time through, you know, people creating different things to improve the lives of those around them and and how that can never really be destroyed. Like, for example, during the Great Depression, right? Why was there so much suffering during the Great Depression? Like, did the factories disappear? Did the cars disappear? Did the, you know, people's clothes disappear? No, all that disappeared was the money, right? So how is it that so many people were suffering if just the money disappeared, <laughs> but not the actual things, the items, right? So the wealth didn't disappear. It was being transferred, right, mm. to... To really to the ruling class, basically every time there's, right, there's right. a monetary crisis uh, and there's inflation and hyperinflation, and then and then they have to change the currency. Usually, wealth is transferred a large portion of wealth from the people who are saving it, usually the middle, middle class, to those people uh, who are well connected with the state, you know, central bankers, things like that, oh, yeah. politicians. Yeah. And so and so one way to to hedge against that or to um, store your wealth is in uh, Items that that don't rely on, um, you know, third party uh, for their value, like like uh, the Federal Reserve note, right? The, the, right. It requires the Federal Reserve um, for its value, and and again, they can't print it. Like they can just print, you know, um, to oblivion <laughs> the Federal Reserve note. Right, right. Um, so so yeah. So how is the yen over there? Would you say the yen is like is is is, is becoming inflated oh yeah i'm sure um when i first came over here six years ago is it uh it was much stronger than the dollar so i think uh what was it 100 yen was like 70 cents so i was like sending money back to the states and you know making money mm. um now it's about even uh but i usually i actually view the japanese government as kind of a mini american government um which is basically what it is the culture over here is totally different but after world war ii Japan just kind of became America's hmm. little servant. Hmm. So all the same games are played here. In some ways, the government is worse. 
Um, but the money is basically the same, just fiat paper. You know? So, and I know you had mentioned earlier, like <clears throat> you said something like maybe Japan's in, in actually more debt or more inflationary danger now than the U.S. So I wasn't familiar with that, but um, totally makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think the Bank of Japan um, is. Uh, I think it's printing mo the most amount of currency out of all the central banks. It's like I remember seeing really? a, ch a chart, like like um, the you know <coughs> the amount of quantitative easing and currency creation out of all the central banks in the world. And yeah, Bank of Japan, um, the European Central Bank, and the Federal Reserve are up there as being like the top. You know, printing the most money. That's not a um, sustainable path. I just it always laugh. That, at that phrase, quantitative easing, it's, it's just such a bullshit term. <laughs> <laughs> just printing more money. What should we call it? Yeah. Quantitative easing? Yeah, sounds good. We know the laws of economics. We know you have to have scarcity. So what can we call this? <laughs> so people accept it. Let's use two pretty big words. You know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I was, I was telling, uh, you know, I was explaining to some of my friends recently um, about about you know the monetary system and and why printing money doesn't make people wealthier richer right because if it did just imagine if everybody's if everybody's bank account like they just added a zero to everybody's bank account does that mean everybody's going to be wealthier like we're all richer <laughs> yeah, right. or if everybody got a million dollars right now does that mean we're all millionaires you know living the living the life if a cup of coffee costs hundred thousand dollars then you didn't gain much <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I use the metaphor. It's like playing Monopoly with someone that just keeps drawing their own money. Like, <laughs> eventually, the money gets spread spread around, but it means nothing. Like, it just means absolutely nothing. Like, everybody can buy everything, and no one's going to win the game. <laughs> Except in Monopoly, there's no inflation, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's not like real life where everybody can't buy anything. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember there were. Gilbert. They were looking at the um, the uh, the rules on the monopoly uh, uh, get in the monopoly rule book, and and one of them it says um, the bank can never run out of money if there's no more if there's no more paper money if there's no more paper money in the bank just just get pieces of paper and write it. <laughs> that is in the instructions. I forgot about that. That's funny. It's exactly the same as the U.S. federal government. Yeah. All federal. Oh, big time! And I remember, I remember hearing a uh, a great uh, anecdote where, you know, you have a group of kids and then a group of adults, and then you show each of them, um, you know, a uh, a one ounce gold coin, um, a hundred dollar bill, or let's say just a one dollar bill, and then a, a one dollar Federal Reserve note, and then a one dollar Monopoly note, and and you ask um, the adults what what is uh, different. You know, which one's the different one? The adults said the Monopoly money. They said the Monopoly money because it's fake, something like that. Yeah, because that's fake. <laughs> and then the kids were like, no, the coin is different because that's actually a real metal thing. And the other things are too, just paper. <laughs> that's funny, so, so the kids and the adults, they had a different conception of what's, uh, I guess, what's valuable or what's real. <laughs> is that funny? Yeah, that is funny. I think kids kind of just intrinsically understand that stuff sometimes. I watched a video. There was a video on YouTube. I don't know if you saw it. It was a guy out on the street offering people either a chocolate bar yeah. or like a silver coin. Mar yeah, Mark Mark Dice. And yeah, Mar Mark Dice. And I couldn't believe it. Like I don't know how much <laughs> I don't know how much they edited out of right. people like saying I'll take the silver, but. The amount of people that said, oh, just give me the chocolate was like, okay, I, I'm ready to go to the moon. I, I don't want to live here anymore. I know. Pretty I, unreal, man. Yeah, yeah. I saw a couple of his videos. Yeah, there was that one. And then there was one where he tried to uh, – he had a, a, a one-ounce Canadian maple leaf gold coin. And it said uh, it said 50 Canadian dollars because I know all these, uh, all these legal tender gold coins, they have to write like anomalous uh, – you know, amount that it's – uh, I guess exchange for in times of a currency crisis, I guess. And, uh, so like a, a one ounce uh, American Eagle is, is a legal tender for $1. Right. But you would never exchange $1 for one ounce silver. Cause right now what silver worth is like $17. <laughs> so who would do that? It's right. stupid. So same thing with the Canadian dollar. It's like 50 Canadian dollars. And, uh, and at that time he did it, it was like gold was one ounce for, um, uh, you know, $1,400 for one ounce. And uh, and so he was trying to sell it to people. He's like he's like you know I got this I got this coin for fifty dollars. I'm willing to give it to you for half off because I need some money. So twenty five twenty five dollars. Will you take it? 
<laughs> was like, I'm sorry, no, I don't, I don't want it. And he's like, wait, you got too much gold at home? Yeah, I got too much gold at home. I don't, and, and, and he kept falling. Like it's like some people, you like, he's like, I'll, I'll give it to you for that that uh, bottle of water. No, I have it a piece of gum. No. <laughs> man, it's like that group think, man. It's the programming, it's just, you know. That's unreal. Um, but yeah, but, so before we go, I want to I want to also ask you since um, I don't often talk to people in Japan. Um, my wife uh, is very nervous about since since Fukushima happened. Um, yeah, you know, she's very nervous about seafood and about basically anybody living in Japan. Um, she's yeah, like, why would yeah. anybody want to live in Japan? You know, and yeah. and so so I guess you moved there in 2010, right? And That's then right. and then the next year Fukushima happened. Yeah, the big earthquake happened. I'm on the Sea of Japan side, so I'm not on the Fukushima side. Okay. So Japan is just an archipelago, right? So the middle is mountains. Okay. So I'm on the other side of the mountains. Okay. But I felt the earthquake. It was long. It was huge. Wow. Um, but Niigata, where I am, was not damaged. I remember watching the news, like one sidewalk caved in a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, as compared to the devastation that uh, I saw on TV. Actually, I came home from work that day. It was a big earthquake, but it was, you know, no damage. I turned on the TV and saw the tsunami. And at that time, I couldn't speak hardly any Japanese. So I thought, oh, they're, they're showing clips from some horrible earthquake before. Uh. But no, it was it was that, you know. And so my mom, my phone's like ringing off the hook and everyone's like, are you OK? And yeah, it was it was pretty crazy, man. But um, yeah, about the fish, you know, you see these there's a lot of fear mongering like graphs that are like uh, kind of going around the Internet where it's like bright orange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leaking. Right. And I'm sure that's happening. But I, but a lot of those graphs are like weather graphs, and they're not uh, measuring radiation. Mm -hmm. So, um, but as far as fish, I think you're probably safe depending on where the fish is coming from. Because I don't know how much is actually fished directly offshore, and I don't think the radiation leaking into the uh, ocean at this point is is so much that it would be contaminating the whole you know, the whole supply of fish everywhere. Um, the seafood on my side is, is pretty fresh and, um, the wind blows away from us. So after this happened, I thought, well, what do I need to go home? Is it okay to raise my son here? Right. Right. But like testing the soil here in Niigata, it's, it's pretty good. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, but at the end of the day, who knows, you know, I don't know. Is, is the seafood safe? Right. I don't know. I think it's probably blown a little bit out of, portion on some of these websites but uh but it's definitely leaking it's definitely leaking and it's creepy here because the media i don't know if you know um in japan it's it's pretty draconian but you can be put in jail for reporting on things that the government tells you not to they just put that in effect two years ago maybe three years ago like you actually there's a list of things that the major media outlets can't report on <laughs> and if you if you call like if you call like uh What's the company? Tepco? Uh, whoever's associated with the Fukushima thing. Like if you call Te to Tepco, make like right? Tepco, yeah. yeah. Media requests too many times and they tell you, hey, this is off limits. You can be jailed or uh, have a court date. Like to give you an idea of how insane it is, I watched a clip of a guy from Tepco going into the ground zero of the radiation zone with no suit. And they filmed him, and this is like Chernobyl, like, you know, helicopters are crashing over Chernobyl because it's just so radiated. And and they're asking this guy, aren't you worried? You know, aren't you worried you're going to die? And he's like, no, it's safe. Like, that is the Japanese culture, like, hmm. stoic, we're fine, everything is fine. So this guy's out at ground zero with no suit. I think he's dead now, uh, someone told me. But wow. this, uh, that that part of it's scary, so to, to really know what's going on with Fukushima is really hard. Um, but I think if you're eating sushi in the States, you're probably okay. A lot of it's probably caught off the Canadian coast, right? I don't know, but... Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. See, it's, see, it's good to hear from people who are living there. And, and I'm, I'm sure that um, uh, James Corbett did some reporting about that as well. Um, I know Luke Radowski with his We Are Change went down there, did a, a couple of videos at, at, the, oh, really? at the Fukushima site. Um, and uh, yeah, so... All right, it's uh yeah because my wife when that happened, man, she was uh, devastated. You know, she's like, I love sushi and I can never ever have it 
for the rest of my life. <laughs> so. well, I'll be your guys' uh, test subject because I'm eating sushi like every week. <laughs> if, if I check out anytime soon, you can you can be sure you should probably avoid it. But I think it's probably okay. You're going to be our gauge. <laughs> yeah, I'll be your gauge. <laughs> it's, uh, is Graham still alive? All right, good. All right, wait, is he glowing yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> Anarchist superpower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, but um, that's great. That's, uh, I mean, it's great to talk to you. Um, I've, uh, you know, it's great hearing about you and your Facebook page. What do you have, like 300 likes or something on your Facebook page? 200 right now on my uh, Voluntary Japan. We have another one, me and my buddies, called Super Anarchy. Uh, yeah. Oh. But yeah, but since we started, since I started Voluntary Japan, it's kind of, that one's kind of just floating out there. But I think that one's at like, 500 or something like that. Which one? The Super Anarchy? Super Anarchy, yeah. So you're focusing yeah. your efforts where? On which one? Voluntary Japan. Oh, voluntary Japan, like, okay, okay. But me and my buddies did that one for like hardcore for like three months and built it up. And, uh, cool. So it's still going. We're still doing it, but right now my focus is on the voluntary Japan stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I noticed that you've been doing shorter videos recently. You you told me that uh, some people have been complaining that you've been rambling. (laughs) But, um, you know, I think, um, you know, I I, I think I I would enjoy, I like your videos where you're talking a little more and you're, you're, um, you know, elaborating on your thought processes and these concepts. And I think that's nice. Um, but that's just me. <laughs> like I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, it wasn't. It wasn't really a complaint. It was just. It was just one guy. Oh. On, uh, it's good advice. But I, I like to go longer. Um. But when he said that, I think I got a little bit trigger shy. I was like, okay, maybe I should uh, cut these short. But I, my nature is just to ramble on. So I'm sure that will be back <laughs> soon. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I've been doing these um, these ten minute videos recently, and I really love them. Um, and I was uh, suggested to do them by Dave from the Seeds Liberty podcast, and he's like, you know, people I think they they want to see shorter videos, you know. So I started doing them, and it's a great response, and you know, a lot more easily shareable, um, and you know, little bite sized chunks of our philosophy, so you can show people. And so, um, yeah, so I've been having fun with that and I've been doing it outdoors and, you know, I, yeah, I think, I like that. yeah, yeah. I, th- I think you do your, your stuff outdoors a lot too, it seems, right? Yeah. I try to do it by the sea as much as possible. Just that backdrop is, is so nice. And, uh, I think those talks are so organic. Like for someone like myself, I like to listen to someone just go through their thoughts and, uh, you know, share a nice background with someone. Like you said, like the, the natural order of nature, it's just nice. So. Yeah, people yeah. Like to see it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it helps to calm people down. And for me, like you know, I did I did my first few videos, the ten minute videos, on uh, in you know inside in a room, and uh, it's just different, um, you know, different energy. And I found that people were, were more focusing on the room stuff that's it, that was in the room, <laughs> and like and like you know, your video was good, but that painting, I really like that painting on the wall. <laughs> I'm like, why didn't you shoot the video so that you can see the painting? Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> so I think that's another great aspect is that uh, so they kind of focus in on, <laughs> on what you're saying. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but but also energizes me and clears my head and refreshes my thoughts. Um, so yes, and it just feels good, you know, to be outside and uh, and do stuff like that. So so yeah, I'm gonna try to do that once a week. Keep that up. Cool. Um, uh, and I hope you do. You keep yours up. It seems like you're doing. You seem like you're doing like one video, what every few days, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Since Steemit started, I've been doing less. <laughs> Just oh, really? writing oh. nonstop for Steemit. But yeah, I'm doing about an average of maybe one video a day or two. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah, good, good. So keep it up, and uh, I will uh, follow your channel. I'm always, uh, you know, checking my feed. You know, if I <laughs> if I see a new new voluntary Japan, which is an interesting name. Like to me, that 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 uh, signifies how many volunteers there are in Japan because uh, you don't really see a, a a YouTube channel called Voluntary United States, right? Because <laughs> like like which one you mean? <laughs> But like no, when you say voluntary Japan, it's Graham Smith. He's it's like ah uh, right, 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 right. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. I never thought about it like that. But yeah, yeah. You are voluntary Japan. I am. I am. Yeah. You represent. <laughs> <laughs> Although I guess I guess so. You said Roger Veer, he's an anarchist, and and James Corbett, right? So those are the, yeah. other, the other two big ones yeah. in Japan. Yeah, yeah, James. And I I talked to Roger Veer just briefly the first time. I messaged him on Twitter and it was just like, 
just like starstruck for me. It's funny. I'm telling my wife, like, you know, most, most people are like starstruck if they would like meet Brad Pitt. It's like, <laughs> I, could, I, I could care less. I'm like, I just talked to Bitcoin Jesus. He messaged me back. You're like, yeah. So, yeah. So how, oh, actually those, that brings- those people are like my heroes, you know, those people are, are changing the world and that's, you know, they're, they're just people. But at the same time, it takes, it takes a lot of boldness to go out there and, and do what like him and Corbett are doing. So, oh, big time! Oh, yeah, big time! You know, to put your ideas out there and and own them and say, you know, I said this, and you know, you if you want you want to come after me for my ideas, you know where to find me is my website. You know, it's like <laughs> I, I think that's really really bold and brave. Right. And that, that's one of the things that, that frightened my wife when I started my channel, my website, is that you know people, you know, she's like, you're gonna go public, and these are these ideas are very controversial and contentious and. Um, you know, what if what if uh, somebody complains or, or you know the the eyes of the state fall upon you? You know, and like, well, we we can't we can't live in fear. You know, you, you have. Yeah, once ahead. you make those, once you do that too, it's so liberating. It's like, well, wait a minute. If someone does something to me, it's not because I did anything wrong. You know what I mean? It's 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 their problem at that point. And yeah. I think that's so much of what keeps us from speaking out. Maybe I maybe I shouldn't do this. You know, but hey, you have to. You have to. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, these ideas, they're just ideas. We're just talking about principles and philosophy. You know, we're not advocating for violence. And and so what's the problem? What's really the problem with that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it it like, just shows the state for, to be what it is. Like, if, if that's going to be, su- if you're going to suppress Danilo for saying we shouldn't steal from people, you know, <laughs> you're a monster. Like, it's obvious <laughs> you're a monster and this, this way of thinking needs to go. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me of... Uh, of a cartoon I saw where, where the judge is talking to the the guy, uh, I guess the defendant. And he's like, "You do realize that it is illegal to point out the illegal things that the state does." <laughs> <I've seen that. laughs> you know, which is every which is every government in history, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's a, a great uh, Voltaire quote, which is um, to find out who controls you, find out who you can't criticize. Exactly. Right. right? Exactly. So so true. So um, so before we go, please, uh, I'd like to uh, let uh, ask people at my guests, um, what is your favorite uh, quote of all time? Wow, that's <laughs> a tough one. I wish you would ask me that beforehand. Oh yeah. shoot! So, but, me, well, well, I like think. I like the shock factor. You know. No, that's good. That's good. Favorite quote of all time. Wow, that is really hard. Um, <laughs> like an anarchist quote, or just any yeah. I mean, quote? just any anything that that pops into your mind. Like, what's something that drives you, that keeps you going, that inspires you? I guess, I guess maybe I'll just go back to Ralph Waldo Emerson. The nice. Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Um, imitation is suicide. Like for me, that that one's hit me hard. It, and it, and for me, and for me, that's statism. That's that's not not just statism, but collectivism, which right, is ultimately right. the real root. Which is, if you try, if you don't use your own mind and your own brain and just follow the herd, it is like suicide. Like you're not, you're not going to be alive. You're not going to live life to the fullest, and you're going to follow, you know, everyone anywhere. Like this election cycle, like I can't even believe it's real. Like I can't believe anyone is actually considering voting for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. Like I just. <laughs> it's just unreal so like trust trust thyself every heart vibrates to that iron string i think ultimately everyone does want to trust themselves <clears throat> but like you said it's really scary you go out and make videos even your own family criticizes you you know you get attacked uh, but there's no greater feeling than knowing that you did right according to yourself and there's no worse feeling i think than just going along to get along with something that you disagree with. So, yeah. Emerson, trust thyself. I'll go with that one. Beautiful. Yeah. I've never heard that one. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. Self-reliance. You should, you should read that essay. It's awesome. It'll, it'll totally fire you up. I think self-reliance. All right. Check it out. Um, so before we go, please uh, plug your, your, uh, your pages again, you know, how people can reach you. If they want to contact you. Sure. Yeah. So YouTube, uh, backslash voluntary Japan, <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is kind of messed up today. Uh, Twitter, at Voluntary Japan. Steam it, Kafka Anarchy. So Kafka Anarchy, but smashed into one word, 84. And um, right, yeah. yeah, message me, whatever. I'm trying to spread the word here in Japan. 
and provide a different cultural perspective to people in the West uh, because anarchy is basically the same everywhere. Uh, everyone's got the same spirit. And uh, so, yeah, check me out. And uh, thanks for having me on, man. Beautiful. Really yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, yeah, you know, you know, I just recently, just to just to close up, I I saw, I just uh, was watching an interview on Liberty Hangout um, between Eric July. You familiar with him? Um, yeah, the uh, yeah, uh, Christian, Christian rapper. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and uh, Kyle Wagner, who is a minarchist. So you know, he, you know, Eric July was with, in, with the anarcho capitalist versus minarchist, like like a debate. And uh, and one thing that Kyle Wagner was saying that kind of got me thinking was. Um, he says he doesn't like the idea that we're all divided. You know, you got the anarchists, you got or the anarcho capitalists, you got the volunteers, you got the agorists and the and uh, mutualists and primitivists and you know, mm. anarcho feminists and, <laughs> and anarcho communists and syndicalists and and then minarchists. And he's like he's like we should all he's like my goal is to bring everybody back to minarchism. <laughs> he's like that's, <laughs> my, that's my goal. And uh and and so and he's like you know we're a house divided right and so we're weak as a result and i don't see it like that you know i i, I think that if we all really had the same message then that would be a boring world right i think the beauty lies in the diversity of messages right like you know like you know to me that is what the free market is 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 everybody contributing their own unique voice you know and giving their own flavor uh, of uh, of what they think is valuable, what what kind of value they want to contribute to the world, and it's not necess- it's not necessary for all of us to have the same message or advocate for the same thing. You know, we all doing it in our diff- our own way. You know, some people spreading the message through rapping, through uh, writing books, writing articles, uh, through. Um, you know, poetry through YouTube channel, through podcast, right? So many different ways to spread this message. And I think that's a beautiful thing, <laughs> you know, so I, I encourage that kind of thing. And it's great that we can talk, you know, have discussions and discourse and debates, um, because that's definitely how how these ideas can get transmitted and fleshed out so that other people can understand them better, right? So, yeah, so it's just right, beautiful, right. beautiful to see debates like that where it's it's civil. It was a civil debate, you know, they were... You know, they weren't like hurling ad homonyms at each other. Which, uh, so, uh, so, yeah, I was happy to see that. But, uh, yeah, just want to add yeah, that. I always find it funny, like the minarchists, I'm always like, okay, you know, minarchy on and let me do my own thing. Right. Well, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, I think, I think uh, you know, you, you got to do it our way. I, I agree with you. But I think, I think anarcho-capitalism allows for basically anything, you know, if, if people agree they want to be this way or that way. Right. You know, variety is the spice of life. So. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I tell people is that um, you know when I talk about anarchism, it's it's not you know people get confused in the in the tangential um, you know rabbit holes of like how would we feed the poor? How would we you know uh, educate? How would we build the roads? How would we protect uh, the weak and feed the hungry? How would we do all this stuff? Right. And to me, it's not necessarily about that. That's not the focus. Um, to me, it's just about starting with yourself and living a moral, decent life and then emulating your, that for your kids so that your kids can become like that. And so you, you just live the way that you want the world to live, right? You be the example. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not even about all these questions. Those are irrelevant. Those are like, those are, you know, fictitious. Like, you know, we can, we can go along these, um, hypothetical scenarios all we want um but it it's really meaningless right because <laughs> you know it really doesn't mean anything it's 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 fun and all and all that but it's really meaningless like to me it's more about yeah, yeah. how do you live your day-to-day life are you a decent person do you treat people with respect you know or do you violate people's consent right that's really what it comes down <laughs> to that's what anarchy is to me so so i think people get too caught up in the uh in the details and I'm like, no, ground yourself and start with yourself, and that's it. Yeah, and and when you do start with yourself, all that big macrocosmic stuff takes care of itself. Yeah, you don't you don't need to feed people ten thousand <laughs> miles away. Someone's starving next door. Why don't you bring them a chicken and then you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Take care of yourself. So beautiful. I love it. Yeah. Awesome uh, conversation, Graham. Thanks a lot for coming on. Um, Cheers, man. My really pleasure. appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, everyone, please follow his uh, his channel, like his Facebook page. 
Uh, he's putting out some good content. Find him on Steam It. He's putting out some great uh, content there as well. And um, you know, hopefully, we can help each other. You know, I, I always like to say the the rising tide raises all boats, right? So when we help one person, we're actually helping ourselves, which kind of sounds selfish, but but anyway, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> good, good selfishness. It's yeah. awesome. It's awesome. Um, so, if anybody wants to help me out, uh, you can do so through uh, Bitcoin, Patreon, uh, or PayPal. Links are below. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. Uh, dollar a show is all I ask. Um, if you find value in my content, please feel free to donate um i love doing this i love interviewing fascinating people like graham here and i want to do more of it and uh, monetary compensation is always appreciated and encouraged right we are capitalists in the end we respond to incentives as everyone does um very few people work for free right <laughs> but uh, it's funny that amazingly a lot of us volunteers and anarchists we do this stuff for free like you said you, you never got paid for your writing um, and you don't get paid for your YouTube channel, but you still do it, right? So why do you do it? You know, because we love it, we're passionate about it, we want to sp- spread a message, right? And and that's what it's really about. So, um, but monetary compensation is always appreciated <laughs> as well. So, um, <clears throat> so awesome conversation. Uh, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at Get. Get cell411.com. That's get cell411.com.